All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining once again. Uh, Sid, can I request you to start us off with a word of prayer, please? Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day as you have given us, Lord. As we are going to start this session, Lord, with a prayer, Lord, all the students who are there, and Lord, we bless Pastor Roshan as well, Lord, as he's going to teach us, Lord, about the local church, Lord, whatever the knowledge you will be getting, it should not be wasted, but it should be implemented and used for the kingdom expansion, and all glory be given to you, O oh Lord. Lord, as we will be learning, that learning should not be wasted, Lord, not just like things kept in our mind and heart, Lord, but it should be used effectively for your purpose, Lord. All glory be given to you, Lord, and thank you for everyone who are joining the class. We name, we pray in the name of Jesus and say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sid. All right. Uh, let's do a quick recap of our previous class, what we covered, what we discussed, and uh, we'll move on to Chapter 3 of Section 1. Okay. Um, so in, uh, in the last uh, class, we did uh, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, which is the church, its spiritual and natural dimensions. Um, we see that the church is God's idea. It's Jesus' idea, and we are to follow his blueprint. Uh, and the word of God is, uh, it's all about that. It, it constantly guides us and on how to build his church. And we started off this whole thing by looking at Matthew chapter 16, verse uh, 15 and 19. We started off reading from verse 13, uh, just to understand the context, uh, you know, the background setting behind, uh, behind that verse, just so we get a better uh, idea and understanding. Uh, and then we see that uh, Jesus very clearly says that I will build my church, uh, right? So that's, that statement is enough for us to understand that uh, God, church is God's idea. And then we as a church, we are we are to advance to the, uh, to the gates of hell because the gates of hell shall not prosper. It will not prevail against us, right? Because the gates are stationary. Uh, gates don't move. But as a church, we are to advance to the gates to bring down the powers and the strongholds of, 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 of hell. All right. And we also move in authority knowing that Jesus has given us the key. Right. We have kingdom authority vested uh, in us. Right. So that was another point. Uh, we saw the spiritual dimension that church uh, is Christ's body and uh, he is the head. And if he is the head and we are his body and if he is eternal, we are the, as the members of his of, of his body are also eternal. Um, right. So that was another aspect we saw. And uh, the church is Christ's instrument to execute his purpose. Um, another re another. So we. We read about the message uh, as well. What is the message of the church? What are, uh, what are we to carry? And that's very simply is uh, the Great Commission, isn't it? Uh, we are to preach uh, the we are to preach Christ crucified. Um, and Paul says that's what we preach. Uh, we don't need to add anything or take away anything from it. And if we, as a body of Christ, we simply uh, do that. Uh, you know, we will be accomplishing what Jesus wanted us to accomplish. And that was all about chapter two: the purpose of the local church, its mission, uh, the message, and the methods. Right. Um, so the mission was very clear for Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 and 20. We all know it's uh, not a great suggestion. It's a great commission, uh, right? And the message is simply preach Christ crucified, right? And, and the methods vary, but some of the key spiritual methods that we have been commanded to follow uh, for our own good, one is pure uh, being pure in uh, in in everything that we do uh, being uh, holding ourselves highly accountable to god uh, in be uh, be a person of integrity and character as you lead your people as you lead your congregation um, and whatnot um, and then and everything that we do we do it in demonstration of the spirit uh, and power Okay, so uh, that's pretty much uh, what we covered in the last class, and I hope you had a chance to go back home and uh, and revise um, when you can. Okay, so that's chapter two. Uh, do you guys have any questions or any thoughts that you want to ask or share before we continue? Uh, 
Hi, Zelatoli. Hey, Prezi. Good to see you. Thanks for joining. Okay, then. Uh, good morning to you, too. Right, uh, let's move on. Okay, chapter three in your PDF, we are on page 16. Uh, in your hard copy, we are page 23. Uh, so follow along as we um, as we progress, okay? So chapter three, we, in this chapter, we're gonna talk about uh, the, the government and the structure of the local church. The government and structure of local church. Uh, are we going to talk about politics and whatnot as soon as we mention the word government? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, not really. Uh, and I'm glad we're not talking about politics and whatnot. But uh, in a, a, a dictionary definition of government or governing, it simply is, uh, and if you Google it, you'll find it, it says that the act or process of governing Right, uh, at the act or process of governing to uh, to control and direct and the making and administration of a policy, right? So there's a method, there's a process. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about. How uh, did the church mature? Or I don't necessarily like to use the word evolve, but then as they grew, uh, what kind of administration plans and or strategies did they come up with how did they begin to govern their people that they are in charge of that you know that they are overseeing uh, that's what this uh, this chapter is all about right we're going to see how the church grew uh, in maturity and how they uh, how they handled their growth because one of the most hardest uh, thing uh, to steward uh, is growth in a very rapid succession right uh, for example if you become too famous at a very young age and if you don't know how to handle that fame uh, where you are setting up for failure right um, and so that's pretty similarly uh, to I mean if you can handle the growth of your church if you can handle the growth of your ministry and if it's growing in an exponential rate uh, I'm just talking about ministry and church but then you can apply that for any any aspect of life um, you need to have a plan to how to handle growth like have a vision and whatnot so that's what this chapter is all about and we're going to learn that and um, I'm excited about it right so one of the first things uh, you know after Jesus is resurrected, we know that he spent solid 40 days, right, with his disciples, um, right? We see that in Acts chapter 1 and 3, uh, Luke records, uh, right, in his uh, in his letter to his friend Theophilus. Um, in Acts chapter 1 verse uh, 3, it says, uh, Jesus spoke with his disciples about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Uh, right in the Gospels, we see that he constantly uh, spoke about the kingdom of God, and then we see that he very specifically in Acts chapter one verse three it says that he spoke to them. Some translation says that he taught them about the kingdom of God. Uh, now in Matthew chapter twenty eight, we see that he gave the disciples, uh, you know, the great commission and whatnot, and then here we see that he spoke about the kingdom of God uh, before he before his ascension and whatnot. But uh, the things don't get very specific. Now, in that 40 days time, we don't read about uh, any strategies that, uh, you know, he gave his disciples. Okay, so this is the plan A, guys. Uh, if plan A doesn't work, this is the plan B. If this method doesn't work, I use this method uh, because, uh, you know, this, uh, I'm a wise person, uh, you know, blah, 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 and whatnot. Uh, the insurance company will cover you just in case we'll, if this fails. No, we don't see all that happening, right? Uh, he did not speak to them at that time about strategies or how they were going to carry about uh, carry out the Great Commission, right? Okay, this is how you are to carry out the Great Commission in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and beyond. Nothing about it. Uh, but then we see all, the only thing that he did mention is uh, don't go anywhere. Right, until you are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
right? And so that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then we know the rest is history. About 120 people gathered together in the upper room. Uh, they were waiting on God to show up. And uh, God shows up. Like he came like a rushing wind, right? I love those choice of words in a certain translation. He came like a rushing wind. Uh, when do you see a rush? Black Friday sale or Amazon Prime Day sale, um, you know, or a rush hour traffic. Uh, when, a, when, a, when people are in a hurry to get to a place uh, or to get something what they want uh, pretty fast, that's when they are in a hurry or in a rush right so and then when i read that word that holy spirit came like a rushing wind something tells me that he wanted to be there more than they wanted him right obviously he wanted to be there because jesus tells that he's going to come uh, <laughs> right so uh on a side note so our approach therefore is to understand what the new testament presents for the functioning of the local church Okay, and then use God-given wisdom to define a government and structure that best implements what a New Testament presents. Okay, so uh, that's the idea behind uh, this whole thing. We see how the church once again grew in maturity and how they handled it. Okay, so uh, page 16, if you're still there, uh, the first local church, um, the first century church, as they, as we as we say, okay, we see that 120 people gathered. Uh, Pentecost happens around uh, 80 uh, AD. Uh, sorry, 30 AD. AD uh, around 30 AD. Okay, so um, on the day of Pentecost, about 120 people, and we see the 12 apostles um, of Lamb as their leaders. Okay, so uh, what is the meaning of apostle? Someone who is sent. Okay, someone who is sent, sent out, sent forth. Okay. Thanks, Jupy. Okay. Um, I guess it's too early in the morning for questions. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, so it, they are set apart. And sent out for uh, sent out or sent forth on a certain mission, uh, like an uh, emissary or an uh, advocate, right? But we have to remember that uh, first century Christians or Jews, Jesus even, I mean, they were all living during the time of a Roman Empire, right? Uh, Romans were uh, were ruling that region, right? So, apostle. Uh, is a Roman word, okay? So what used to happen is that after a Roman Empire uh, militarily has conquered a certain region, right, geographical region, uh, after, after they've won militarily, uh, then they would send a fleet of ships, okay, fleet of ships to certain uh, to that region that they've conquered, and the lead ship of the fleet of ships, right, the lead ship was called the Apostle. Uh, the sole reason and uh, the sole purpose of that, uh, even the person, uh, people coming in that apostle uh, ship is, uh, was to make the region. Let's say, for example, um, the Romans capture, give me a region, uh, they captured Jerusalem or whatnot, right? So that now the fleet of ship comes. Uh, the whole purpose of the advocate on that ship, apostle, is to change the environment and the atmosphere of that city into that of a Roman uh, environment or an atmosphere or culture. So they would change the a geographical setting completely to that of a Rome, uh, how Rome would look like, the culture of Rome. So when Caesar came to a certain city that they have conquered militarily, Caesar would feel at home. Are you guys with me? So uh, now, uh, now the first century church, the apostles, uh, as as we speak, they thought, okay, uh, the idea behind this was, okay, something must have stood out for them. Okay, if this is the purpose of that ship or the people from that ship, apostle, what they're thinking, okay, we uh, are to go into all these cities, regions, uh, change the culture to that of heaven. Okay, so that. that when God moves, okay, so that God would feel at home, 
when he moves when okay so he can come and show up so that's basically the idea behind uh the apostles uh the word apostle right okay so now we see that Peter was the first initial leader, and then you know Peter gives his famous sermon. Uh, Three thousand people are saved, and whatnot. So everybody is looking up to Peter. He's the man. He's the boss. Like you, the man. You, the dude. You, the boss. Everything, uh, right? But then uh, he was like, okay, so I can't be here now. I have to, you know, move on. Uh, you know, take care of missions, and he starts going to different cities and whatnot. Uh, and then now, later, we see that James takes over the leadership of the Jerusalem church uh, because Peter moves on, right? Um, and we see that in uh, Acts chapter 15, uh, around, it's again mentioned in your notes, guys, Acts chapter 15, at the first council in Jerusalem, we see Apostle, Paul, Apostle James as a primary leader. Okay, and uh, and we also see that Paul, Apostle Paul, uh, refers referring to James uh, as a primary leader in his epistle to Galatians, uh, Church of Galatia, in chapter two, verse nine. So, um, so something is happening now, right? Something is happening, isn't it? Uh, after the, after the movement, so there is the birth of the church. Uh, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They're looking to a leader. And then the leader moves on, and then now they, uh, the new leader is appointed, James, uh, and then that leads to a different. Uh, uh, it gives birth to a different set of leaders, which are known, uh, who are later known as deacons, right? Deacons, emergence of deacons. Here's what happens. Okay, so uh, the note says, subsequent to the twelve apostles who were in leadership uh, at the inception of the Jerusalem Church. Okay, so there were twelve apostles, uh, like founding fathers, members of uh, the Church of Jerusalem, so to say. Um, the first role we see emerging is that of deacons. Uh, now we see that deacon uh, is comes from the Greek word diakonos, which simply means helper, servant, attendant. Uh, I think somewhere uh, in this day and age, some the meaning has changed. Uh, deacon means entitled and stuff like that. But <laughs> but the original meaning uh, is helper, servant, attendant, right? It comes from uh, the Greek word. But uh, let's look at the verse that's mentioned there, going back up in Acts chapter 6, uh, verse 1 to 6. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 6. It says, now, in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, that means they were growing, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, Gentiles, right? Uh, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Now, they were distributing food uh, and whatnot. Um, and just, you, we, can, we can read the previous chapters as well, just to get the context, but we're not going to do that now. Um, so what, this is pause here, OK? What, uh, what uh, pushed, what was the push uh, for the birth of deacons, at, which at that time was not yet mentioned, uh, was a feedback. Like we all love a good feedback, isn't it? Uh, we, we we do that all the time here, at, at least at APC. Um, after a major event, I uh, was involved in youth ministry. Uh, you know, after every say, major youth meeting or a youth conference or a youth camp, especially, uh, you know, we'll send out a feedback form and we'll get a bunch of feedbacks uh, saying. You know, there was not enough food for vegetarians. There was uh, no water in this. Uh, the rooms were too hot. We needed AC uh, and uh, yada, 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 all the stuff like that. OK, so yay, feedback. So the disciples received the feedback, you know, complain uh, that, hey, I think a certain sect of people are being neglected. Uh, that means. Uh, it's not intentionally, but then administratively, something was not happening because uh, the the twelve the focus was somewhere else. So that's what it says, verse two. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples 
multitude of disciples, that means they've grown exponentially now, and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Okay, so what is that business? None of your business? No. <laughs> uh, the, what is the business? Wait over the tables, right? Wait over people, wait on them, uh, you know, just so you serve them food and whatnot. But verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the, to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they said before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Right? Uh, I mean, it, it's amazing, it's wonderful to see uh, how, with so much reverence, they, they approached, uh, which can look like uh, a mundane thing to do right uh, like a like a regular routine kind of a thing okay you are to wait on uh, you know on the tables you have to just distribute food that's going to be your role uh, and they prayed about that okay um, what what I would do and what I've done is basically is like okay I think so in this you know I'm talking about youth camp and that's how we plan uh, hey can you can you take care of the food department that means just make sure the food is on time uh, you know all this all there's enough plates and uh, whatnot uh, I didn't pray uh, he said okay let me just pray okay now John Paul is going to lead uh, this food department um, and somebody else I mean Anita maybe uh, take care of all the on the ladies and in their rooms and whatnot but then it's so wonderful to see they, they approach this thing with so much of reverence and honor even for such a, a routine kind of thing that looks like it and the, and the criteria that they set was um, they had to be men with good report like honest repute uh, honest uh, report like good reputation uh, full of the holy spirit full of wisdom uh, took responsibility for it and who take responsibility uh, to whatever they have been given right it's amazing isn't it a good reputation yeah sure uh, you can find people but you know full of the holy spirit the emphasis on that and full of wisdom um, is something that stood out to me um, right so and that's the initial birth uh, of what we now call as uh, what, which later grows into becoming as known as deacons, right? Simply means once again, a helper, a servant, or an attendant, right? A helper, servant, or an attendant. Um, I was just reminded of this verse. It's kind of random in Genesis chapter two, I think, verse eighteen, when when God says it's not good for man to be alone. Then I will create for him a help meet opposite him. That's what he says, right? Uh, I will create for him and help meet. And old translations use that. Uh, modern translations use different words. But then I was like, wow, you know. Uh, so just because they are serving tables or whatever it is, they are they're not lesser in any way, so to speak, right? They're not they're not in. They're like, it's not like okay, I'm 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 in charge of preaching and teaching and whatnot, and and you are down here cleaning the tables distributing food etc and whatnot um, but like there was so much of respect and honor amongst themselves that it, that they treated each other equals um, right so while we know that these seven men were not called deacons at this point in Acts 6 we recognize that the role they played eventually came to be called deacons okay um, so we see that in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, this is addressing and saying that uh, it's not just men uh, who are called to serve uh, or to be de called to be deacons and whatnot. We see the women are also, women are also uh, involved in ministry back in the days of the Bible, and they are too as well. Right? It says, I commend uh, uh, to you Phoebe, our sister, who is 
a servant of the church in Sancreia, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Okay. Um, more about it. Let's just uh, let's look at the next verse, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints of Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with bishops and deacons. Okay, Paul greets the believers in Philippi, so he is addressing the leadership uh, team there as well as bishops and, and deacons. We learn more about bishops in, in as we move further up in the in the chapter. Okay, uh, okay, but are you all are you all with me? Uh, uh, you're following? Yes, no, maybe, or am I just ramming my name away? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, but two of them said yes. But two or three are gathered. He said yes. Yeah. That's that's that works for me. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, First Timothy chapter three, verse eighteen to thirteen. It says, "Likewise, deacons must be uh, reverent, not double-tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let." These also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. Okay, let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanders, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. Okay, so going back to the houses, uh, for those who have served well as deacons, uh, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so uh, basically the standards uh, that expected of a deacon uh, of a church was high. The standards of such of uh, purity, holiness, integrity, and character. Uh, everything that we speak of now and everything that we, is expected of any church leader or any Christian uh, now was that, right? The standards were really high. So, but the next section is very uh, simple and uh, interesting. It goes on to say that the deacons were not just involved in administrative functions of a church, right? Uh, just making sure all the numbers are right, all the name list is right, uh, making sure that you're calling all the first-time visitors, uh, you know, they've been called, are you making sure that they've been followed up with, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's not that, but they are also encouraged uh, to be engaged in spiritual ministry. It, we all know the story of Stephen, uh, you know, how he was involved. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and how he went about ministering in different synagogues. And also Philip, right, who was called, uh, who was called later to uh, go and minister to the eunuch, right? We see that and he was called to go after the chariot and whatnot. And so there were deacons were also engaged, uh, were encouraged to engage in spiritual uh, ministry as well. So you see, to th slow things down, okay. Jesus gives the Great Commission. Uh, 120 of them, uh, you know, meet in the upper room. They wait for the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes. Uh, but prior to that, Jesus is teaching them about the kingdom. The day of Pentecost, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. The new church is born. 3,000 members are added to it. Uh, 3,000 people, guys, I mean... <laughs> just, <laughs> just pastoring uh, 50 people can be quite a task. Uh, okay, uh, can I hear an amen? No, <laughs> okay, uh, but 3,000 people that's quite a number, but all of them had to be uh, equipped, they had to be uh, discipled, right? They had to be empowered, they had to be taught about more about the word of God and whatnot. So, for all of that, they needed an administrative team. Uh, when Peter moves on, James becomes the leader, and then we see uh, deacons being formed. One feedback. Uh, is uh, is the beginning of the birth of a 
deacons working together as a team, right? Uh, and then in this section, we see that they're basically called to serve. That's what it is, right? They're called to help administratively, but they don't, doesn't mean that they stop at that. Uh, they're encouraged to engage in spiritual ministry. And now because of that, new churches are being raised, right? So, uh, and as we progress in the book of Acts, we see the increased persecution in Jerusalem, which causes believers to scatter out of the city, right? So uh, we know what happens, right? The persecution increases, and the one who is in charge of the persecution is uh, Paul, also known as Saul, um, right? Uh, was in charge of the persecution. And because of the persecution, as a result, uh, people start to scatter the Jews, uh, the Christians uh, start to scatter. And, and as a result of that, uh, of that scattering, if I may say, uh, new churches are being formed. In Acts chapter 8, uh, 32 AD, um, Philip, a deacon, was used by God to preach the gospel with signs and wonders and to plant a local church in Samaria. Philip, from uh, serving the tables, uh, distributing food, uh, as a deacon, as a helper, is now planted a local church in Samaria. Um, right? Churches were raised up in other regions such as Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Lida, or Lida, whatever you want to call it. A local church is raised up in Antioch, um, in Saida. Okay, uh, Antioch is um, modern day uh, south central Turkey, by the way. Okay, it's not complicated. You just Antioch in Google, it will tell you what is modern day Antioch. It'll tell you. South Central, okay, Turkey. <laughs> so uh, it's it's what it is, right? So all these new local churches were planted by ordinary believers. Uh, we see just people who were distributing food and just being faithful in the little things that they were called to do. Now we see these people are planting churches across cities uh, that is just mentioned, right? And of from deacons. The next emergence of leaders, as we uh, see, uh, is we see the birth of elders, right? The emergence of elders. So in Acts chapter 11, it's about approximately 46 AD, 46 years after death, right? We see the leaders at Jerusalem referred to as elders. Um, so in Acts chapter 11, verse 30, to be more specific, uh, it says, this they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Uh, as I always say, guys, uh, I, I would encourage you to uh, read the whole chapter for you to understand the context, right? Um, so we can read one verse, it's fine, we get the text, uh, but for you to understand the context, you have to read the entire chapter uh, before and after. So it's always good. Okay, so this is they also did verse 30 um, and sent it out to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the elders included not only the apostles but other spiritual leaders like Barnabas and prophets like Agabus. Okay, Acts chapter 17, 11, verse 27 and 28. Now it's suddenly, it's not just one person. Uh, now, now it's becoming like a council of people, right? Uh, like a group of people uh, who are being known as elders. Okay, uh, in Acts chapter fourteen, verse twenty-one to twenty-three, uh, it says, "During the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas returned to the communities of new believers in various places where those churches were being uh, formed, and appoint." elders now we see paul and barnabas in action they are teaming up uh, in their missionary journey um, and they're going to these new new communities new churches that's being planted across cities they're going there with one purpose is to appoint elders okay let's read that chapter acts 14 21 23 it says and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, 
strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tri tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Okay, so the progression doesn't change at all, right? Uh, everywhere they went, you see, it starts off with preaching the gospel. When they had preached the gospel, after they had preached the gospel, uh, they go into the most more administrative kind of work, right? Okay, they, they preached the gospel, they made disciples, that's one thing, they, they were equipping and empowering them uh, in the word of God, they're encouraging them that hey, it's all about the kingdom of God, they taught, taught them about the kingdom of God. Now, we can't be with you forever, we can't be with you in one place uh, for a long time. Uh, and so we are going to appoint elders, you know, who will take care of you guys when we are not there, while we are gone and, and whatnot. So, and they're going to be there to take care of the local church, right? So appoint elders. Now, uh, yes, it go ahead. Did I see your hands raised? Uh, do you have a question? Did you just slip over the button and press the raise hand thing accidentally? <laughs> Sorry, Pastor. Okay, no worries. <laughs> okay. So uh where, where did we stop? Okay, appoint leaders, right? Appoint sorry, appoint elders. So uh Appointing is just a process of what we say, uh, what we use uh, the word ordain for, right? Uh, now we use the word, okay, you know, he's ordained as a pastor in this church. He was ordained uh, as a pastor in so-and-so church. Uh, he was ordained by so-and-so, 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 right? So that's, what, that's basically the word used there for appointing elders as well. That means elders were ordained. Right. It's it simply again means to elect, to appoint, uh, or to designate uh, to an office, right? That they are in charge of. So, uh, and once again, you see that the appointing of elders was done with prayer and fasting, right? And uh, the spiritual exercise than just you know, hey, okay, who wants to be elders now? It's just you know, you can come and be an elder and whatnot. Uh, and but another interesting thing is um, th the word elder comes from the Greek word uh, presbyteros. Presbyteros, as you can see it uh, in the notes, um, it's from that word we get one of the denominations called Presbyterian. Right? Uh, it simply means uh, a spiritual leader. Right? For example, uh, it says here uh, the word elder comes from the Greek word presbyteros, from which we get the word presbyter. Uh, which is used in some churches these days, as we know it. In its original sense, the presbyter refers to a spiritual leader and can be used for anyone in spiritual leadership. Okay, so anyone in spiritual leadership can be considered as a presbyter. That's just a Greek word, um, right? Who's been appointed or ordained um, in as a leader or in, as an elder, so to speak. Okay, so uh, apostles and elders, they're, calling, they're, they're called to be uh, work together as one leadership team. All right, so we see that in later in the first council at Jerusalem, we see the apostles along with elders at Jerusalem deliberating over a problem of whether the Gentile believer had to be circumcised as per the law of Moses. Um, now, once again, so it is another challenge. Uh, or another feedback or another misunderstanding or uh, what do I say not misunderstanding or another uh, not misunderstanding discussion or what uh, I'm not getting the word uh, that brings these two groups together uh, to function together as one council and the challenge that they had at the time was uh, the disciples of the apostles of Peter and whatnot they were dis uh, they were preaching that okay hey if you're a Gentile and if you're going to believe in Jesus uh, you need to be circumcised 
and then you know we know the story the paul is not for a, uh, it saying okay you know we're not going to go discuss about that guys right so a misconception yeah okay <laughs> uh no what, disagreements i think yeah okay let's say disagreement so they were they were disagreeing uh, on a certain doctrinal things and so they thought okay the best way to bring the settle the score is to let's have a discussion let's you know come together uh, right so the apostles and elders came together to discuss this serious matter indicating that these new leaders were recognized and respected of their leadership okay so whoever were appointed as elders and uh, and leaders so, you know they they were brought together in what we can call it as a council of uh, the church leadership just to discuss about this thing okay so uh, it's wonderful isn't it because they recognize that okay hey this is an issue uh, you know this is a disagreement and it's not it does not just come down to one person it does not just because Peter was there when the first church was born just because he preached and 3,000 people were born uh, born again doesn't mean that he gets to say whatever he wants to say let's discuss let's have a discussion let's talk it out okay and they are acknowledging each other's uh, you know leadership authority which was you know given to them and they discussed about it uh, uh, right so uh, that's one of the uh, I think that them functioning as a team uh, is is this is fantastic to see in 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 early churches, right? Uh, elders at Ephesus, uh, more elders, right? Later in Acts chapter twenty, the apostle Paul calls for the elders of from Ephesus to meet with him at Miletus, where Paul had stopped while on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, Paul recounts his two years of ministry at Ephesus and gives his final words to these leaders. Um, right? So in Acts chapter 20, verse 17 and verse 28, it says, From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. Therefore, verse 28 says, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock among with which Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, now we see a very interesting word there, a new word, uh, a new word as in a word called overseer. Okay, so apostle, deacons, elders, and now overseer is a Greek word translated as bishop. Okay, Greek word translated as bishop. Now, um, the word bishop, the word elder, presbyter, overseer um, are used interchangeably now. Okay, uh, an overseer of a congregation, now it just simply means, a bishop simply means a pastor as well. Right, a pastor is an overseer of the church, isn't it? So, uh, a pastor is a spiritual leader of a church. Right, uh, pastor is also the elder of a church, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the terms are used interchangeably here. Okay, so um, that's what uh, Acts chapter twenty verse twenty eight. Uh, it's talking about. You know that when Paul was is telling them, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Okay, flock. That word. Uh, when do you use? That means, in, in other words, he's saying you are the shepherd. Take care of your flock. Okay, a pastor is a shepherd of a church, right? Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, right? To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Notice the choice of words there, the progression of it to shepherd the church. Peter, church of Apostle James. No, it's the church of God, which he which he purchased with his own blood. Okay, it's complementing to the initial uh, passage that we read. The church is God's idea. Jesus says, "I will build my church." Right. Um, so that's wonderful to see there. Uh, but as a conclusion of of that section, right. Um, 
as just a role of what was the role of this elder or presbyter or bishop or an overseer it had three things it had spiritual maturity they had to show spiritual maturity set a godly example of the christian life uh, display demonstrate spiritual uh, ministry labor in word and doctrine spiritual oversight guard the sheep okay uh, those were the three important uh, things uh, that was the role of this elder is once again spiritual maturity spiritual ministry and spiritual oversight All right so i'm going to pause there and um, and just reflect on some of the things that we've learned and uh, you know i, I want to remind us that that this subject is for everybody it's not just for those who are called to be become pastors or those who are already pastoring uh, and you know it's for everybody when i say if you call for children's ministry worship ministry youth ministry uh, whichever ministry uh, we are the body of christ we are the church of the living god right uh, we are to reflect uh, on this and just pause and say hey um, you know if i'm called to serve the church of god uh, these are my roles as well it's not just the role of my senior pastor it's not just the role of my worship pastor etc but it is also my duty my responsibility uh, to set a spiritual maturity standard in spiritual ministry and also to care for my flock uh, to care for my fellow church members and whatnot it's not just a responsibility of a team in the church right so let's pause there we'll take a 10 minutes break and uh, i'll see you all after the break okay. have a good one <laughs> 